proposed to playing a guitar on your hip here, you're right. reaching over an acoustic body. I'm still trying to put a bit yeah. of welly into it, you know, and uh, the, the art of it really is to not put so much welly, welly into, into it. it. Right. Relax. Stroke it a little and you, bit. And you're not <laughs> doing this quietly, are you, either? Because <laughs> Sorry. You're, you're not doing this quietly. You're going to do... The, the full gig is going to... You can hear it on Radio you 2. You want to make us nervous, don't you? Is what it is. <laughs> no, no pressure. Being filmed no, 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 as well. No, 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 no pressure when can we hear, When can we hear it on Radio 2? Live. Wednesday, Wednesday evening, Wednesday. I believe. So yes. you're playing at the Roundhouse, aren't you? Mm. And the whole thing is going to be live on Radio 2. And it's actually a status quo day because you're doing various interviews that are on with Ken Bruce, I think, in the morning, yeah. aren't yes, you? Yes, yes. Um, and then in the afternoon with Steve Wright. And then build it up to the Roundhouse in the night. It'll be great. Steve as well, are we? Are we? I didn't know. I didn't know that. Yeah. God, that's going to be a day. It's great. Today's it's going to be a day. It's going to be a busy day. It's yeah. 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 Honestly, we you've been outside warming up and it sounds absolutely beautiful. Thank you. It really does. Well, Francis and Rick will be performing. They new version of pictures of matchstick men at the end of the show on their album aquo stick yeah, <laughs> yeah stripped yeah. bare yeah. is out uh, now yeah. Yeah. now uh, paper plane it's track number four on the album and uh, although you can't obviously fly a paper plane no. andy kershaw has been to meet a group who uh, get as close as possible east lothian where the northern sky meets the north sea well according to the bunch of enthusiasts I'm on my way to meet. The best way to enjoy this landscape is not down here at sea level, but 2,000 feet up there. Meet the microlighters. They fly these winged wonders that cost less than a hatchback. Today is the 25th anniversary of the East of Scotland Microlight Club. They're a diverse bunch but all connected by a love of microlighting. Matt's been flying for just six months, but he's every inch the pilot. Matt, I'm intrigued. Which came first, microlighting or the pioneer aviator's moustache? Well, it was actually the moustache I grew first. <laughs> uh, grew the moustache and thought, what will I do with this? And I'll, I'll be a pilot. Can you put your finger on precisely what the thrill of this is? It's always sunny above the clouds, and I absolutely love that. Um, if you can find a, a way up through the clouds, um, it's just like a huge, expansive, snowy mountain. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's incredible. You need a steady hand and a keen eye to fly microlights, and Matt also puts these to good use in his day job as a tattoo artist. There are some similarities between microlighting and tattooing. You need your full concentration. Uh, one false move could end up in disaster. Have a great trip, old man. Very good. The flying tattooist. Matt was introduced to microlighting by this woman after he did a tattoo for her stepdaughter. Jill runs the club. I enjoy people and I enjoy microlights, and when you put the two together, magic happens. And you never know who you might meet at this club. We've got plumbers and yeah. joiners. We've had judges. <laughs> we've got an architect. We've had doctors and vets. We've got a lot of IT people. <laughs> Doesn't everybody? Do you think I could fly a microlight? Of course you could. Right. Of course you could. Would you know a good tutor? <laughs> I think I might. I think I might. Jill was taught to fly by Gordon, and they've topped off the pilot's licenses with a marriage certificate. He's taking me up in a record breaker. <laughs> it's really special because we've got two world speed records with this machine. Have you? Which have just been verified in Switzerland with the FAI. Yeah. Uh, so this is officially now the fastest microlight in the world. Wow. With a top speed of 106 miles an hour, this machine isn't exactly supersonic, but when you're microlighting, it's the little things that matter. And is there anything else I need to know? Unless you want to try some hang gliding, don't touch those two switches. Why? What do they do? That'll stop the engine. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, you've got instructions on your knee there. Oh, yeah. The bottom instruction, relax and enjoy. <laughs> that could be the club motto. This is a community of people with a sense of freedom. For them, microlighting is much more than just a hobby. Now it's my turn to find out what they're on about. Absolutely tremendous. 
And it's that exposure, I think, that sense of vulnerability that we're just hanging here that gives a really true sense of flight, far more than I've ever had in any other aircraft. From up here, you really do get a whole new perspective on life. That was, that was fabulous. Thank you very much. <laughs> what an experience. Oh boy. Cheers, Andy, and thanks very much as well to Angela, Gloria and Julia. Rip Off Britain continues live every morning this week on BBC One. And now, tomorrow, James Nesbitt is going to be here, but now to play us out with an acoustic version of Pictures of Matchstick Men from their new album, It's Status Quo. And do look out for pictures of your long-lasting friendships. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> of the BBC in Northern Ireland. We know where Dracula began. We know where Frankenstein began. It's a place full of darkness. It has its demons that suck the lifeblood from the city. Discover the night horror was born on BBC Two and plunge deeper into the art movement that shook the world with BBC Four. The season starts with the art of Gothic and continues with the family that built Gothic Britain. Tonight and tomorrow at 9 on BBC4. The path through life is full of danger. Do what you must 
to survive. Respect your enemies, but when you have to, fight. The next generation are your legacy. Keep them safe, whatever it takes. Many lives, one epic journey. Life Story starts Thursday at 9 on BBC One. Pack your bags. So where are we off to? And join Len Goodman on a trip down memory lane. It's just as I remember. Welcome to 1959. <laughs> Relive the sights and sounds. Yummy. Of summer's gone by. You know, Len, I'm quite enjoying being on my holidays with you. Holiday of my lifetime. Tomorrow at 3.45 on BBC One. Yes, celebrating 90 years of the BBC here in Northern Ireland. And what you're seeing on your screen right now should take you back 40 years or so. Why stop there? Let's head back even further in time now with a bit of nostalgia as we walk the line. And as you'll find out, not everyone loved the railways. For me, trains are about getting from A to B. But there are people of all ages who love the romance of the golden age of the railway. When the first train left Great Victoria Street for Lisburn in 1839, it changed our lives forever. Fast, dangerous and exciting, the railway sped up the pace of industry, commerce and communication. At one time, almost everyone in the country lived within five miles of a station. People who had never been out of their hometown or village could take a trip to the city or spend a day at the seaside. I'm much too young to remember all that, but I've spoken to people up and down the country who can't understand why most of our railway network was abandoned almost 50 years ago. I want to find out what the attraction is to see if there's any trace left of these old lines any hidden history to be found in some of the places they pass through. And that brings us to tomorrow. Temperatures will rise to about 18 or 19 degrees for many of us. Then as we look ahead towards the rest of the week and into the weekend, plenty more dry weather to come. Well, there you are. That was the weather. Not looking too bad at all. Perfect for getting away from the weather desk for a few days to walk the line. My journey today takes me from the ecclesiastical capital of Ireland to the seaside town of Warren Point. I'll be finding out about the Armagh astronomer who put the bricks on the railways. The instruments here are simply too sensitive. How tragedy changed the course of railway history. This was Armagh's Titanic. And I'll be meeting the Warren Point emigrants brought together by the railway 50 years after it closed. But I'm starting my journey on what remains of a branch line two miles southwest of Armagh. Behind me is part of the old Armagh to Castle Blaney railway line with the River Callan flowing below. Opened in 1909, the section between Cady and Castle Blaney has the dubious honour of being known as Ireland's shortest lived mainline railway. It closed in 1923. But the fact that it was built at all is due in large part to Milford industrialist Robert Germani McCrum. Milford is a model Victorian mill village designed and built by Robert McCrum. Its main purpose was to house the workers from his mill. It had no pub and no church, but in its heyday boasted a football club, a cricket pitch, a cinema, and it even had a ballroom which could rival any other in the country. McCrum was a true Victorian philanthropist, providing good housing, schools and leisure facilities for his workers. But he was also a canny businessman, and to stay ahead of his rivals, he needed to get his goods to market as quickly and economically as possible. McCrum spent years petitioning the government and railway companies to build a railway that would stop here at Milford, after all. It would give him access to the lucrative markets of Dublin, Belfast and further afield. 
And finally, in 1903, work began on the railway between Armagh and Castle Blaney. But only after McCrum first stumped up £3,000 to pay for the first section of track, which would come as far as here in Milford. Just up ahead of me is the old Milford station platform. And from here, a separate track would have taken the goods to and from the factory below. Milford Cutting was created to meet the needs of industry. But when that industry began to dwindle, it spelled the beginning of the end for the railway too. The line here closed in 1932. But it hasn't been totally neglected. Since the 1980s, its unique habitat has been managed by the Ulster Wildlife Trust. When they built the railway, you saw the embankment out there. So between the drumlins, you would have had low land. They had to build that up. And then when they hit the drumlins, they had to cut through them. So this is a, is a man-made environment and was. It was purposely dug into the hill, as I say. And because of the management that was exercised in those days, because they were steam trains, these embankments had to be kept clear of scrub and vegetation that you can see on this side and would have been kept clear on both sides. And they would have cut the grass regularly as well and then removed the grass cuttings, again, to stop fire from the embers, from the, from the engines. And we have been trying to replicate those management practices to this day, basically to encourage the orchids and the wildflower populations that are in here. These are the fragrant orchids, the long purple ones smell really heavily of cloves if you walk up in there. It's really weird getting that Christmassy sensation in the middle of summer. And these are actually quite rare as well. The fragrant orchid is a, a very rare species along with the marsh hellebrine. Um, and again, it's reflective of loss of habitat and land management that, you know, with the improvement and the intensification of farming, plants like this just don't stand a chance. We have to take a fairly hands-on approach to managing it now or we'll lose it. Milford Cutting came about because one man was a passionate advocate of the railways. I'm heading into Armagh to find out about another who went to extraordinary lengths to stop their development. No engineering project is without its opponents. And 160 years ago, the coming of the railway was met with as much fear and hostility as it was excitement. Nothing could have prepared people for the speed, power and noise of trains, and they were frightened. Landowners thought they would ruin the countryside, and farmers feared their livestock would be mown down on the tracks. In Armagh, the most outspoken opponent of the railways was the director of the observatory, Thomas Romney Robinson. In 1857, he launched a campaign to have a law passed that no railway should come within 700 yards of an observatory. His objection to the railways was that they interfered with the astronomical the instruments, instruments he had just paid a lot of money to have installed. So here we are. The, these are the two main instruments then? Yes, mm -hmm. the two instruments were all the fuss was about. This cost a small fortune. Why did he need this? Uh, this, the two instruments together are for measuring very precise positions of stars in the sky. And this one measures the equivalent of the latitude of a star in the sky, and this one measures the equivalent of the longitude. And the two of them work together. Astronomy wasn't just an abstract science. At a time when sailors looked to the night sky to navigate the globe, and many ships were lost at sea, having an accurate map of the stars was imperative. Robinson believed using these new instruments, he could produce a catalogue of star positions better than anything that had gone before. He went to a lot of trouble to get these new instruments here, and then along came the railways. That was his next problem. This one of the fundamental things about observatory instruments is that they must be mounted on very solid foundations going down to the bedrock underneath the observatory. So unfortunately, that also allows the vibrations to go the other way from, say, the railway station through the rock and to the observatory instruments. Robinson's letters to Parliament urging them to rein in the expansion of the railways are still kept in Armagh Observatory. 
It is, of course, impracticable if this surface be agitated with tremors, although so slight as to be invisible to the naked eye. This is really his uh, opening shot through the Board of Governors that the instruments here are simply too sensitive that you can't have a railway so close by. That's right, in fact, yes. We won the battle, that the Act was passed, and it did stop railways encroaching near observatories, both in Ireland and in, in Great Britain. In later years, Robinson softened his stance, and when the Armat and Urey Railway Company asked to build a spur line a little closer to the observatory, he relented, on the condition that there was a speed limit of five miles an hour along that section of track. But even Robinson couldn't halt the spread of the railways. They had become part of everyday life for thousands of people, and not just for work. By the end of the century, the railway companies were laying on cheap fares and special trains to places like Warren Point, Portrush and Bangor. For the first time, families who might never have left their neighbourhood could hop on a train, spend the day at the seaside, and be home in time for tea. On the 12th of June, 1889, a train full of school children left Armagh. They were on a Sunday school excursion to Warren Point. 800 tickets were printed, but it's thought that on the day, as many as 1,200 people packed onto the train. Families would have gathered here outside the church in Abbey Street. I suppose buckets and spades and picnics would have been the order of the day, packed lunches and so on. Uh, because, you see, this was not just uh, going to the seaside. It was also a trip on a train. When the party arrived at the station, hundreds more people were waiting to join them. Extra carriages had to be added to the train, and despite some concerns that the engine might not be fit to pull such a load, and a little later than scheduled, the train set off on the hour-long journey to the seaside. Three miles outside Armagh, the train got into trouble on the long climb up to Derry's Crossing. It stalled just short of the summit. The driver, Thomas McGrath, and the man in charge on the day, James Elliott, faced a dilemma. Should they send word back to Armagh so that the next train could help push them up over the summit, or should they split their train in two? They would then take the leading carriages onward to Hamilton's Bond Station, returning later to pick up the rest. They decided to split the train. By disconnecting the engine, the back portion of the train was held only by the handbrake in the guard's van and some stones wedged onto the wheels. As the front portion of the train moved off, it slipped slightly, nudging the end carriages back and crushing the stones beneath. Despite their efforts to recouple the train, the carriages could not be stopped rolling back down the track, picking up speed as they went. The doors were locked. This was the practice of the time. For the one and a half miles, that was panic, pandemonium, horror. No one can imagine what was happening. Back in Armagh, the scheduled 10.35 train had just set off, completely unaware of what was happening up ahead. And by the time the driver saw the carriages hurtling towards him, it was simply too late. He tried his hardest to brake, but collision was unavoidable, and the last three carriages of the Sunday school excursion train were completely destroyed by the impact. Eighty-nine people lost their lives. 260 were injured, one-third of them children. It was the worst real disaster in Europe. Many people would now say that this was Armagh's Titanic. And for this particular church, Armagh Methodist Church, uh, our minister at that time, uh, McMullen, Reverend McMullen, was in Cork at the annual conference of the Methodist Church, and he came home, and his son was killed. His Sunday school superintendent, Samuel Steele, uh, was killed along with his two daughters, Sarah and Ethel, 
and their cousin Hetty Wolf. And I came aware that his choir, half of them were dead or injured. But it wasn't just the Methodists, it was Church of Ireland, Presbyterian, Roman Catholics, everybody. Going for a day out to the seaside on a bright sunny morning turned out to be a dark, fateful day. And it was only fitting that on this 125th anniversary there is a sculptor erected on the Ma with all of the names of the 89 people who were killed in that horrific accident. Jack Wolfe is a descendant of one of the organisers of the railway excursion, the Sunday School Superintendent Samuel Steele, who died in the accident along with his two daughters and Jack's aunt, Hetty Wolfe. This is Jack's first visit to their graves. Why did you want to come here today? Well, I, I saw an article in the Irish Times uh, on the 12th of June this year, and uh, it, 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 it jogged my memory, and uh, I decided that uh, I had to see this. Two daughters, only daughters, yes, the poor thing is Sarah and Ethel. Hetty, Hetty that's with my aunt. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's only 10 years old, all killed. It's quite emotional, really, because I've heard about it all my life, and I'm, I'm 90 now, and uh, my father had told me many times about, about the whole dreadful disaster for the family, and yes, it's been a, 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 quite an experience to see them all, yeah. The terrible loss of life at Armagh shook public confidence in real travel. Such was the outcry that within three weeks of the accident, Parliament passed legislation requiring the railway companies to put in place improved signalling and better brakes to ensure such a disaster would never happen again. Building the railways had been costly, difficult and often dangerous and while construction from Armagh through Hamilton's Bawn and Market Hill was simple enough, the higher ground close to Newry posed quite a challenge. Following the old railway line through the hills above Jarrett's Pass, I've come to explore a remarkable piece of Victorian engineering. This is the Summon Tunnel, and at one yard short of a mile, it's the longest railway tunnel in Ireland. It's in remarkably good condition. The track and the sleepers were pulled up years ago, but apart from that, I imagine it looks just as it did 100 years ago. And you can see the alcoves that were built for the workers. It meant that they could duck in if a train was coming along. But the one thing you really notice is how cold it is. It's at least several degrees cooler than outside, but at least there's light at the end of the tunnel. At one time, there were a quarter of a million men employed laying railway lines across Great Britain and Ireland. Travelling the country and living in makeshift huts along railway cuttings and embankments, navvies had a reputation for hard drinking and fighting. But these men achieved amazing feats of engineering, armed with little more than gunpowder, picks and shovels. At the summon, six shafts up to 200 feet deep were driven into the hillside. Men were lowered in large buckets to the tunnel floor from where they cut through the slate rock. This was backbreaking work. In difficult conditions, there was little light and the men were constantly drenched with water. I can't imagine what it was like to work in there for 12 hours a day. At the height of construction, 1,500 workers were building the line between Newry and Armagh, but the men who built this were brought in specially from the north of England. They were miners, 
hired for their experience working underground. Many of them stayed here for up to three years, some even brought their families, but their presence wasn't universally welcomed. In 1861, the local paper reported that a group of Irish navvies, denied work in England, had turned up at Le Summon intent on causing trouble. The riot that followed was only broken up when local farmers pitched in on the side of the English miners. Then, according to the paper, the navvies skedaddled to Newry. If tunnelling through the South Armagh countryside was fraught with difficulty, then bridging its valleys required the best architects and engineers in the business. To find out more, I'm meeting consultant engineer Dennis Grimshaw at Craigmore Viaduct, just a few miles south of Le Summon. The two chief people concerned were Sir John McNeill, and was employed by the railway company to design their main bridges and structures. The contractor was William Dargan, who ran his own major construction company and was responsible for building at least 65% of the railways throughout the whole of Ireland. William Dargan was arguably the most important Irish engineer of his time. He'd learned his trade working alongside the great Scottish engineer Thomas Telford, and by the time he came to build Craigmore Viaduct, he was at the pinnacle of his career. It had been quite spectacular. They first of all had to build a complete wooden formwork right up to the underside of the arches over the whole length of the viaduct, with access ladders and so on up to this, cranes to lift the blocks of stone up, and the whole arches were then, were then assembled on top of this formwork which was taken away afterwards. Everything was done to the highest standard, the best mortar and granite used for the bridge, a very nice aesthetic design. The viaduct is actually partly on the curve as well, which made, made it much more complicated to build. The Egyptian arch over the Camlin Uri Road is also the work of Dargan and McNeil. One of the most unusual railway bridges in Ireland, it's pure theatre, an expression of the glory days of the railways. But in those days, people who ran large companies didn't have to account for every penny they spent so they could afford to, to, to splash out and do something special now and again. And there we have the three in just coming in the background, still very much in use no, today. Still very much in use to the present day. The main Belfast to Dublin railway bypasses Newry, but the old line from Armagh stopped at Gora Wood and then made its way down into the town. There it wound through the streets. Over five level crossings, the canal and the river, before picking up steam on the straight run up to Warren Point. Narrow Water Keep is a 16th century defensive tower. Today, traffic hurtles past on a dual carriageway but until 1965, it stood watch over one of the most scenic railroads in Ireland. Even before the railway opened in 1849, Carlingford Lock was a well-established tourist destination, thanks in part to a little book called The Picturesque Handbook of Carlingford Bay, a kind of Victorian lonely planet. It set out to show English tourists just how accessible this area was. It was less than a day's travel from London. A district beyond most others for scenic beauty, salubrity, cheapness and excellence in accommodation. That's quite the sales pitch. And it goes on. It says, were this bay laying on English shores, this would be a world's wonder. It also told readers that within a year, a new railway between Newry and Warren Point would make this area even easier to explore. And when the first train left Newry in 1849, it was a cause for celebration. The local press described how thousands came in their holiday dress to witness its departure. For just over a hundred years, the line brought holiday makers in their droves to the little seaside town and was held in great affection by those who used it until it closed in 1965. I'm meeting a man who fell in love with the railway when he was a boy on holidays in Warren Point. 
Barry Damlio is back to complete a film that he started making 50 years ago. In 64, when we knew that the, the railway was closing, my parents found that they were coming on holiday to Warren Point. And uh, we came with two still cameras and I had a 9.5 millimeter cine camera. And we bought as much film as we could afford and came and spent the holiday taking pictures and shooting movies. And then we sort of put everything away in a cupboard and for about 40 odd years did nothing with it. What prompted Barry to go looking for his old film was stumbling across a Warren Point online history forum. He decided to post some of his photos of the railway and was overwhelmed by the response. One of those who got in touch via the forum was Pauline Reardon. Hello, Pauline. Hello, Barry. A lovely, lovely to meet you. Yes, at long last. Pauline asked if I uh, had ever known her dad, George Walker, who had been the signalman. And I said, oh, yes, yes, George was very kind to us. You said uh, you hoped he had made us tea on his primer stove uh, with, with his blue billy can. In fact, Barry had a photo of George in the signal box with the blue billy can perched on the mantelpiece. And I think that blew you away, oh, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> there were no photographs of my father, except at weddings. And then all of a sudden, um, my niece said, have you seen the photographs of Granda on the internet? And I thought, what's my father doing on the internet? And that was how I got in, involved then. I'm, I'm seeing pictures of my father that um, were unbelievable. Daddy actually working. It was almost like I could reach back and touch my father. And it was absolutely wonderful. He was quite a reserved yes. man. He was very tolerant, very kind. And I'm sure he had words in ears because I was allowed to go anywhere I wanted. Barry and Andrew were allowed to play with the levers in the signal box and I most certainly was not. Pauline made a comment that she was sad that the only memento of her dad's working life she had was the Ulster Transport cap badge. I had a chat with my brother, who back at the age of 11 when the railway closed had uh, uh, turned into quite an industrial archaeologist, uh, acquiring anything that he didn't think the scrap men needed. Um, amongst them was her dad's cap and his flags and the last logbook. And you've got the cap here today? Yes, yes sir. Can we see it? Um, I don't think he wore it a lot. No. Um, it was a bit like his false teeth, he only wore them for funerals and weddings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think the person we've actually got to blame for all this is, is George himself. Because if he hadn't leaned out of his signal box and bellowed at the two of us on the platform, are you coming up? <laughs> we would have never met and... We would never have got to this point and we've no. actually come full circle. It, it's the full circle bit which is really rather lovely. I mean, I'm managing to give back stuff that we have had for, for 40 odd years. It's wonderful and I'm sure my father would be absolutely delighted. <laughs> when I started out on this journey, I never imagined the railways bringing people together so long after they closed that the old lines had so much beauty and history to them, or that a terrible tragedy on this line would improve the safety of rail passengers right across the world. Next time, I'll be exploring the old Sligo, Leitrim and Northern Counties line. The best and most exciting times were the cattle trains. A long forgotten battle in Balik and how railway enthusiasts in Enniskillen have come up with a novel way to display their love of all things steam. Yes, indeed, one more bit of walking to come, and you can see that next Monday at half past seven. Later on tonight, our True North series continues with a visit to the town that has a type of rock named after it. Just one of many reasons to love Larne, the jewel of the Antrim coast. Hope you can join us at 10.35.
Hello, I'm Sophie Long with your 90 second update. There are too many paedophiles to prosecute them all, so says the head of the National Crime Agency. Keith Bristow thinks up to 50,000 have accessed child abuse images online. Police will focus on the worst offenders. From the Oxo mum to all creatures great and small and strictly, actress Linda Bellingham has died aged 66. She recently spoke about her decision not to continue her treatment for cancer. People want immigration fixed and I will fix it. That was David Cameron's pledge today on EU citizens moving to Britain. He gave no details but said there will be new proposals by Christmas. Last night's huge fire at Didcot Power Station won't affect electricity supplies, according to its operators. An investigation is underway. Terrorism has been ruled out. Shoppers in Scotland are now paying at least five pence for every carrier bag. The moves to cut litter, schemes in Wales and Northern Ireland saw a 70% drop in their use. The local news with Donna Trainer. A two-year-old girl is in a critical condition in hospital after an alleged assault in Bessbrook yesterday. A man in his 20s is being questioned by the police. MLAs are debating the latest stage of a bill drawn up by the DUP's Lord Morrow, which tightens the law on human trafficking. The bill contains a clause which would make it a crime for anyone to pay for sex. There will be strong winds and gales overnight with heavy squally showers and some brief spells tomorrow. It's EastEnders next tonight and Fiddle's out of hospital. Andy's just itching for a fight. The blame game is back. I have to go to work. <laughs> and it's taking to the road. I didn't get no bitch! I didn't have it! This is a flagpole. <laughs> and what belongs on the flagpole? The flag! <laughs> The first show in the new series is in Lard. This has got to work, people. Take cover. The Blame Game returns this Friday, 10.35 on BBC One. There are very good, solid scientific reasons for being really quite frightened just now. Doctor Who, Saturday at 8.20 on BBC One. Celebrating 90 years of the BBC in Northern Ireland and indeed we are heading back in time tonight with the new tricks team at 9 o'clock, the last in the current series. Now though, time to play Happy Families in EastEnders. Aloysius, do your homework. <laughs> oh, we'll just call them after you if you want. Yeah, two Ronnies.